Chapter 15 It was deathly quiet inside and dim, the gloomy effect of organic lading and kelp-enriched silence. I sniffed at the air. I detected the slasher, but didn't see him. And then I saw him. On top of a shelf, at the top of a carton, marked Vital Vittles, the veggie version of Virtual Veal. For a terrible moment we locked eyes. And then he was on me, a million pounds of him scrabbling tic-tac-toe on my spine while he hissed in my earlobe, Get off of the case! I bucked like a bronco, which got me zilch. I decided to roll with it, rolling over and taking him with me. We rolled on the floor, rolling over and over and over again, till we smacked on a barrel of mineral mice, the fortified biscuit with iron, and bam! The barrel went over and tipped on its side, emitting a mountain of mineral mice and a pouring of pellets that heaped on our heads. There must have been tons of them raining down like a tropical deluge. There must have been tons of them raining down like a tropical deluge, a thundering storm that engulfed the horizon and roared in my ears. For a frightening second I thought I was dead. I was looking at blackness as black as a tomb. I was totally buried in vegetable rodents that smelled like turnips infected with beets, and I thought, if it's over, I must be in hell. Then I thought, if I'm thinking, I must be alive. I gathered some strength and I fought my way out of it, scrabbling upward and into the air. Behind and below me, and under the mountain that seemed to be easily seven feet high, I could hear my opponent beginning his climb. I leapt to the counter and braced for the fight. And then suddenly, crack! From behind an archway, a door popped open. A man came out, still wiping his hands on a paper towel. He looked at the mountain and very suddenly, quite unexpectedly, started to laugh. I looked at him laughing and started to gasp. It was Mr. Mittens, the red-headed giant I'd seen in the alley. I stayed very still. He hadn't seen me. I held my breath. He moved to the mountain as Slasher surfaced. Slasher looked up at him. Slasher looked scared. Then a funny thing happened. The man, still laughing, went over and lifted the thug in the air and said, Slasher, Slasher, what have you done? But he kept on laughing and settled the gangster on top of his shoulder and nuzzled his cheek. Slasher looked goofy, as much in love as a teenage human, a moonstruck girl. I watched as the linebacker righted the barrel. He settled Slasher on top of a box and said, Listen, stay there, I'm getting a broom, and then walked through the arch again. Slasher turned. I moved down the counter and placed myself squarely in front of a rack full of porcelain plates. If he wanted to jump me, he'd shatter the plates. But he wouldn't want to. His friend would be mad. He measured the distance and measured the cost. Then he shot me a look full of savage venom. All right. So you got me now, Pally, he rasped. Only now's not forever. You hurt my Jimmy, there ain't enough room in this city to hide. I jerked at the archway. Is that Mr. G? Are you stupid on purpose, he said? Or did somebody beat on your head with the side of a wall? Mr. G's just a customer. That there's Jimmy, and Jimmy's my buddy, and Jimmy's a saint. And I'm warning you, Pally. I lifted my paw. Look, I'm not after Jimmy. I hoped I was right. All I'm after is the kitten. The one at the pearl? I nodded and waited. You won't hurt Jimmy? I won't hurt Jimmy. He glowered and glared. My buddy Jimmy, he rescued my tail. I was out in a death row cell in Canarsie. The Peterson Pound, if you heard of the joint. I ain't done nothing. They never charged me or give me a lawyer or nothing like that. They was just going to off me. And then came Jimmy. I lay down my life for him, honest to Pete. I looked at him levelly. 
Listen, Slasher, supposing my target was Mr. G. Do you think you could help me? It might be arranged. He threatened my Jimmy. I nodded. Go on. So it's late last night, he said. Ten of eleven. We're open till midnight. This G comes in. So Jimmy looks up and he says, Hey, Mr. G. Like he already knows him, you know what I mean? Only G ain't a smiler. You know what I'm saying? He leans on the counter and he lays on a tail about some kind of burglar that's burgled a kitten to feed to his cobra and lamb to the pearl. To room 37, he says. And then he pulls 200 bucks from the seat of his pants and he says to my Jimmy, You rescue kittens? Go rescue me this one and come to my house. And Jimmy agrees to it? Sure he agrees. I mean, second of all, he got use for the money, and mostly of all, he's a stand-up guy. And you're robbing a robber? It ain't like a crime. So then what happened? So Jimmy comes back about three in the morning with ice on his head, and he phones Mr. G, and he mumbles, I blew it. So then Mr. G has a fit on the phone, like he threatens my Jimmy. He says he could fix it that Jimmy gets homeless and loses his store. I thought for a moment. So, who's Mr. G? I got no idea, Pally. Nothing at all. I could say what he looks like. Whiter in tuna and fatter in turkey on Thanksgiving Eve. I've got one other question, I said. You got no other questions, Pally. You're done for the night. He gestured at Jimmy, who came through the archway. I leapt from the counter and raced to the door.